the set so we couldn't figure out where you lived all right you're okay. live i'm pretty sure yeah. you're live i'm live let's double check why is it doing this because i'm double checking this is the work computer okay yeah you're live okay so should i just start yeah, yeah you're, on. you're on hey i'm live look at me i'm live and i'm so excited to have a, a great comedian jp sears oh i love him so much uh and I'm and I have him on the show. I can't wait to talk to him. But I want to say that I first heard of him from my friend Kathy O'Brien, who has a great sense of humor. She's my idol and everybody's idol. She is so much the reason that there is an awakening. And I have a picture of her meeting you backstage. But she's the person who turned me on. She goes, "Have you have you seen this guy?" And you know, you think being a comedian, I would know, but you know, because of shock and awe and trauma that I've been through, thanks to uh, the world being the way it is and our government being the way it is. I was not aware of you, and I apologize to myself first for not knowing about you for uh, like two whole years. And um, also, the another thing that happened is you came to Hawaii to the big island, and my daughter goes, oh, well, we won't be over tonight because we're going to go see J.P. Sears. He's, he's here in Hawaii. And I'm like, what the fuck? You taking my grandsons to see, and you didn't even ask me to go. I wasn't even invited. That, and she goes, oh, "We we didn't know you knew who he was." You know, it, like kind of assuming that you know I'm in the old batch, which of course I am. But come on, I, I was so pissed. But my grandsons love you. So everybody in the family's a fan. All my friends are fans. I'm a huge fan. I'm so honored to have you here. Now I'll shut up. I can't wait to talk to you about a million things, though. Thank you so much for being on my show. You are, you're, you're the, you're a friggin' warrior, man. You're so damn funny and genius. Hi. Well, thank you, Roseanne. I mean, that I've, every drip of that is ridiculous coming from you. I mean, you're a legend. You were, I was watching thank you and your comedy before I even knew how to read. I still don't know how to read. Um, so all those compliments coming from you, they go right to my heart and right to my ego. I'm now more narcissistic than I was before this conversation started. And please tell your family that uh, significantly betrayed you. I appreciate them. <laughs> I will, bastards. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't get to, I didn't get to see you because you, it was sold out, and I was so pissed. I wish you would have done another show. Or yeah, called me at least. I mean, I I wish we would have known each other, and you could call me, and I would have said, "Come on over after, or meet me up, and yeah, come well, and see my museum. I got a weird museum over there that you would love. And if you ever come back to the Big Island, you call me so you can come to my museum. Okay. I, First of I all, would, what? I would love to. And I, I normally I was doing a comedy tour in throughout the Hawaiian Islands every New Year. I'd been doing that for the past couple of years, but then. Whoever it is, Bill Gates, Klaus Schwab, just all these guys decide like we're going to do COVID. So had to, you know, be, haven't been able to do the tour for the past couple of years. But I think when when Team Freedom wins, and it is indeed winning, in my opinion, I'll be coming back to the Big Island, do shows. I want to see your museum. I want to clean out your cat's litter box. I want to I want to do everything. <laughs> Oh, I, I can't wait till a day comes where we can sit and just talk about comedy because I'm assume I know that first you were like a life coach guy and I guess you didn't know how funny you were, right? Or did you? Well, you know, I, I was in denial and quite honestly, I don't think I had high enough self-esteem to think my sense of humor was anything special, but I, I, probably like so many comedians, I grew up like you know, I was always the funny one in the class, but never thought like I could do anything with this. So I started my career path by dropping out of college after three months because I'm apparently I was smart enough to know not to waste my money on that. Didn't know what the hell I wanted to do though. But quickly thereafter, I got into like these alternative studies on holistic health, fitness, nutrition, and then like stress reduction, emotional healing that led into the whole life coaching thing, which was super great work. I learned so much about myself. Developed. What year was that when you were doing that kind of work? 
So I started in the year 2000. Oh. I, I was 20 years old, didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I had a lot of ambition to mm -hmm. learn a, a few things. So I was doing that and, and I think it was 13 years into the life coaching career. That's when I start to like get these ideas, like these life concepts that we can all relate to. I had these ideas to portray these concepts through the language of comedy. But I, I would, of course, tell myself like, wow, I don't know how to do comedy, even though like everybody around me always thinks I'm funny. But eventually I just said like, I, I don't know, like I don't know how to do the thing I don't know how to do. Just like a baby doesn't know how to walk until it does the thing it's never done. So let me just make one funny video. It'll probably suck, but I'm going to do it. But when I made that video, it woke something up inside of me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had never had a creative outlet my whole life. No music, no art, no structured comedy, no anything. And I know you know what creative fulfillment feels like. So when I tasted that, it's like, dude, I suck at comedy and I love expressing comedy. Yeah. So just tasting that inner fulfillment just left me hungry for, for more. Well, um, so here you are, you're a life coach and you like that kind of work. I mean, I've seen your videos where you're talking about it and you, you felt pretty fulfilled doing that, right? I did. Yeah, it felt me meaningful to me. I had a good time doing it. I felt like I was genuinely contributing to the betterment of humanity. So and you're that kind of guy. You're the kind of guy that's got like the... Uh, like huge spiritual longing to connect with people and to bring a good message to the world. Yeah. So in other words, in Hawaii, I fit in best in Kauai with all the hippies laying in hammocks and meditating and probably doing too many drugs. Yeah. But then it's incredible to me that you like go to real core and you uh, make fun. You're, you end up being the perfect guy that makes fun of you. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. That's Dude, like a story within a story. I like that. Yeah, man. I mean, if we can't laugh at ourselves, we're freaking hypocrites. And, it, and I think Oscar Wilde said it best when he said, life is too important to take seriously. Yeah. So I looked at my, my first phase of comedy was making fun of the spiritual world because that's what was my world. Like I was all into like, cool, you meditate for 45 minutes. Well, I do 60 minutes yeah. <laughs> to you. So wherever a person is, there the human ego is. And I think the right. best comedy comes from portraying how we're in denial of our own egotistical yeah, nature. Yeah, absolutely. The arrogant and the ignorant, how they just stand so tight together. But then get in between those two and like dropping a little seed that it ends up exploding the fuck out of the whole thing. It's just so awesome. That's what I love about comedy itself. So it's great that I, I can't believe that you never in your childhood. Well, I guess you were the kind of comedy that you did was was it the silly kind or were you the bomb dropper kind of funny kid? You know, um, it was more the bomb dropper. It's like, yeah, okay, the teacher's talking. Let me wait for that moment where I can <laughs> deliver one line, hopefully make the whole class laugh. And if it goes well, the teacher will laugh too. Therefore, I won't get in trouble. Right. But but if it doesn't work, then JP gets in trouble. So yeah, that like goofy slapstick, that was never really my style, but more the dry wit, satire yeah. and and I know I'm doing my job well, even like when I look back when I was a kid, I knew I was doing my job well as a comedian if there were confused people. Yeah. We'd look at and be like, Dude, is he serious or is he joking? It's like, I don't know. You, you decide. I liked when Virginia Woolf was talking about writing and she said the gift of the writer is to put the severed parts together. Wow. And it's, I always think of that because it's like, uh, how comedy you, you have all of those, um, you know, that's how you construct a joke is the two things that don't seem related. And then it ends up that they are, if you can make it happen in the joke. And when I'm watching you, that's, I'm thinking that a lot about you putting the severed parts together that construct, uh, you know, and illustrate like the great hypocrisy 
that we deal with and myself being somebody who fell by the wayside, or at least they think I did of uh, their incredible fucking hypocrisy of which they're so way too arrogant and ignorant to even know that they have, and they don't even care. Yeah. They, they don't seem to care anymore. And, and I'm curious, like I, I don't watch TV. In fact, I barely even watch Netflix anymore. Yeah. Is there anything that's, and I don't mean to put you on the spot. You probably have friends in the business, but no, I'll put you on the I spot. don't anymore. Are, no. are there any shows that are still actually funny no. on TV now? No, as a matter of fact, I was talking about this last night with uh, a friend. Actually, I don't remember who the fuck I talked to anymore. I'm so old. I don't remember what. Good huh? friend. You must <laughs> yeah. have been a good friend. Oh, yeah. You know, I only care about what I say. I never listen. Whoever there, they're just, you know, <laughs> just somebody tried jokes out on. But, Absolutely. Uh, but uh, uh, now I forgot what I was even saying. Uh, uh, about nothing funny on TV anymore. Oh, yeah. I said um, the people that are in charge of comedy now, they're like the the children of the most privileged idiots that ever lived. <laughs> and their kids now are in charge and never worked a day in their life. They look at people's hands to make sure there's no calluses on them because that's how they define people as if they if they've done any work in their life that definitely beneath them. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, they punch down in their arrogance and the, in their joke telling it's all about that guy down there who, you know, yeah. does everything for me, including wipe my ass. <laughs> He's an idiot. Yeah. That that's it, you know, and they're the ones in charge of comedy, and they have no, they don't know what's funny, and if it does happen to bite them in the ass, they hate it. Yeah, yeah, so well said. And you know, I I think if we look at one of the shows that's classically been one of the benchmarks of comedy, certainly in the seventies and eighties, like Saturday Night Live used to be genuinely funny and and now I, I don't i don't think it's a comedy show anymore i think it's a propaganda show yeah. and, and why i say that and why i think so many other shows or maybe all of them are here is i think the number one principle in comedy that i believe in is the truth principle yeah so if you're if you're coming from a place of truth and usually a hidden truth that like it's there but like we're not really seeing it all the mm -hmm. time but when you can bring that truth to the light of day, just like you mentioned, you drop the seed in and it blossoms. And if it connects everything, then you get the explosion of laughter because there's there's coming from the basis of truth that all of our feet stand on because we're connected through this thing called reality. Yeah. But when you abandon the truth principle for the narrative principle, we're living in a time where a very low percentage of the narrative is based on truth. So if you're switching the truth principle for the narrative principle you don't get genuine comedy because there's it's like farming in soil that's not made out of dirt it's like oh that's that's like chemical goo you're farming from and that's why nothing funny grows you can have stuff that agree you can get people to do courtesy labs and like punching down like yeah nice sketch about joe rogan what a misinformation <laughs> yeah. moron yeah but it's not funny. No, it's not. It's never funny. It's not funny. It's just arrogant, frat, arrogant, frat boy, privileged, friggin'. It's all so privileged. And, yeah. uh, you know, what is it like 2% of people in America have that background of being privileged. So it's like directed, of course, it's propaganda when you direct it only to a small, that small of a fraction of privileged people. What about the rest of us? We want to laugh. Fuck, yeah. we want to laugh at you. You're the funny ones, you stupid <laughs> bastards. But, you know, there's none of that. They, You can't. I, I knew when Obama had signed that NDAA thing, and I said to my friends, oh, great, now comedy is illegal. And this was way back when. And I think it was 2013. I'm like, now, now they're going to come and arrest us for telling jokes. What, because, what was the NDAA thing? Um. Oh, my God, I can't. I won't be able to put it in good words, but. You know, just about uh, what you're allowed to say, what you're allowed to criticize, how they can come back at you for things having to do with um, uh, Chelsea Manning and uh, the stuff about 
you know, what, what we can say, the truth we're allowed to expose. Because look what they did to Chelsea Manning. For show, look what they did to the people who exposed what Obama's government did. Yeah. So, of course, following that is to say anything about Obama at all. And that's what I meant. So you couldn't tell a joke about Obama. And I said this like in 2014. So it's kind of ironic that telling a joke about somebody, Obama's brain, Valerie Jarrett, telling a joke about her is what undid my whole life. So mm. you're so not allowed to make fun of Obama or of that particular uh, ruling class out of Chicago. You don't make fun of the people of Sh the ruling class of Chicago. Don't do that. I guess not. But <laughs> isn't it true that the, the ones who tell us they're off limits, they're the ones that need to be made fun of the most. Yeah, they are. That, to me, that's like the tyrannical king. They need a court jester in order to, you know, make fun of them, not in a shaming way, but in a way to yeah. point out their blind spots, their egotistical nature, even their self-indulgence, whereas any leader is, by definition, meant to serve the people. And I think archetypally, a, a court jester helps keep the king's ego in check. But when the king says, no court jesters around me, now we know we have a tyrannical king. That's exactly right. And I was yesterday, same thing, talking about the role of the jester. And it was the role of the jester was to serve the king by making everybody laugh with the king about the king's foibles. That's what kept, that's like the consent of the governed, you know, in a Absolutely. way. Huh. And, and it's like, I mean, I'm sure you've laughed at comedians like hanging out with them or even people doing stage comedy about you. I'm sure you've been able to laugh at yourself. And, oh, and I yeah. love it when people, you know, make fun of me. It's like, cool. Like we're connecting over this and like, fuck, you're right. Like I do do that. Yeah. It's a great compliment that somebody would invest the, the time and the thought into like going, Hey, I'm giving you a gift of some self reflection that you may have missed. And then you go, great. I, I learned something about myself, but to go, you, thou shalt not critique me. Just the thought of uh, it's like, Oh my God, what do you think? I mean, I really wanted to ask you because you're so right on and so concise in my opinion uh, about, you know, the, the undercurrent of the funny you're doing, you know, you are making fun of this, uh, horrible Stalinist shit we're living through. And it's like, you are helping to pull us through it too. So I thank you for that. You're, you're like right there. Uh, on the edge, helping to pull us through with this great gift of laughter, because that's the thing that really words and uh, like my boyfriend says, everything's strung together with words and it's words that can take it apart too. Yeah. And then when you could turn them words into something that elicit this great emotional ha, group, ha, you know, it's just so it is so spiritual and it's just so meaningful and uh god you do it so great i'm just really proud of you i'm, I'm proud that you stand there and that they haven't figured out a way to take you down because you're too goddamn smart for that well th thank you and uh they've tried to take me down and and but, but it, i think when man I, I think you can relate to this better than i can when you become willing to risk losing everything they can't take anything from you because you can look at the the money, the status, like things that like, all right, inherently someone could take that from you. And you had people take, I, I can't imagine how much money from you when they kicked you out of the show. And, and now you're in a place where like, you're good. You're not controllable. You are dangerous to the propagandists because you're not controlled by fear because you don't fear losing everything because you've had everything already taken from you. Or, you know, when my, when I found out my wife was pregnant back on April 7th, 2020, yeah. that's right. When right around the time we were starting to figure out like, Oh, the pandemic's not about a virus. And I start doing comedy portraying like this, like, bullshit that's going on i'm thinking like cool this is what i've always done like who wouldn't like this 
but a lot of people didn't like it. So around that time, my, I learned my son was coming along. I knew I had a choice. I can, I can stay true to the truth, stay true to the mission of serving humanity and freedom and risk losing everything, being deplatformed, cancel, whatever. Or I can be a little bitch and, <laughs> and not be true to the truth, play it safe, but have assurance that I won't lose everything. But guess what? If you play it safe, you have nothing. Yeah. You have shit that you think matters, but it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Money and status. But what you're robbed of is meaning, a sense of purpose, and being true to yourself. So, but especially knowing my son was coming along, I knew I, I have to do a little bit that I can do. I have to do everything in my power to ensure that my son never has to have explained to him what freedom was. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think I, I became dangerous that moment. Uh, I became dangerous to the narrative. The moment I became willing to risk losing everything because I know like what really matters, family, love, I can never be taken. Well, hopefully they won't figure out a way to do that with yeah, that. We'll see. But, but if they do fuck them. Yeah. You, you, you have hope which I find that interesting. No, Dude, well, no, it's great. And sometimes I find it interesting too, <laughs> but I'll tell you the moment we can't laugh at the bullshit that's happening. We look at Klaus Schwab and like, bro, you're so evil. Don't put yourself on camera. Uh, yeah. Or we look at Fauci. It's like, bro, you're a bond villain. What are you doing? Like, go behind the scenes where you belong. Like you're too obvious. The more you talk, the more you wake people up. So when we can laugh at stuff like that, we have hope. But the moment we stop laughing, we lose hope. Well, I think there's point. always hope. But yeah. if we were laughing, we remind ourselves in spite of all the darkness, we remind ourselves there's light. And I think yeah. that's an important reminder. But I'll also tell you, I don't think I'm just a delusional optimist. You know, ever since, uh, what was it, when uh, after the pandemic hit and places start opening back up, of course, I'm doing shows in Texas first. That was like May of 2020. But then as soon as like September of 2020, I'm in Portland. And, and then I'm in San Francisco. In these places where you watch the propaganda networks and you'd think like, dude, like, don't go there. There's nobody that likes freedom, JP. Nobody yeah. wants to see your show. Dude, I sold out I, in Portland, I think 12 shows. Oh, great. So what, and I don't say that to brag, but 12 shows now. Yeah, um, hell yeah. But I say that because what my experience has taught me traveling the country, going to the diversity of different cities is people who want freedom, people who know that free speech like everything else hinges on that. Yeah. We are the majority. Yeah, we you are. watch CNN and I believe there's deliberate mind control to make people who love freedom think that they are in a minority so that they feel shame and bullied into complying with a woke narrative. But that's exactly it. It's the people who uh it, it's so funny how the MK Ultra works on CNN. I watch the TV stuff only in clips on the internet, which I want to talk to you about. But my son says you're you're working on some blockchain stuff, which I don't understand at all. But it's interesting. Just that's the concept of it is interesting. If you want to talk about it, yeah. Um, that that's real rebel stuff. But uh, I forgot what I was friggin' saying. I'm so old. Oh my God. I can't well, remember anything. Well, uh, and I love that. You uh, <laughs> forget what you know, so you can remember what you don't know. Um, but, but a, uh, can I share a note on the blockchain stuff I'm yeah. working on? Yeah, please. So uh, I got in, very heavily involved with a company named Zion. People can check them out. Just get Zion. How do you spell it? Zion, Z-I-O-N. Oh, like Zion. Zion, yeah. Yeah. And so I got involved. I'm with Jewish, that. so I love that. Oh, hell, we named it for you. Oh, I cool. You I knew yeah. it was all about me. 
Yeah, we're, we sat down and we're like, <laughs> what would Roseanne like? Damn. <laughs> So I got involved with the company, not because I needed anything more to do, but because my heart told me I have to, because it's a way, it's it, even beyond just my comedy, it's a way to bring the, the digital infrastructure of freedom and sovereignty back to humanity. Cool. So uh, uh, first of all, uh, the problem that we're all well aware of, in, in a word, I would say the problem is centralization yeah absolutely it, yeah it, communism I mean, yeah 100 percent. centralization is a polite way of saying communism but yeah. that's what it is uh -huh. so you look at you know right now the pressure on spotify to deplatform joe rogan and they deleted like 100 of his episodes and you look at gofundme taking Robbie that money the, taking that money from probably a lot of people who are you know working class people they're all working class people taking $9 million from them, but in the okay. YouTube deplatforming people and you and I every day, we're at risk of being deplatformed on YouTube and all the mm -hmm. centralized social media, but that's our fault. Why? Absolutely. Because we've become very reliant on these centralized companies, yeah. centralized companies, basically meaning they're a middleman between us and our connection to other people yeah, whether absolutely. it's like connecting to them with yeah. our words yeah like kind of social media or connecting to them like i want to give you money freedom convoy yeah we it's an old paradigm and we're living in the time where we're really feeling the pain of what it is to be trapped in the centralized paradigm mm -hmm. and, the and matrix luckily, we can easily call that the matrix can't we I think that's the perfect name for it. Mm -hmm. And now we have an option to red pill ourselves. Hell yeah. And, and, and I've heard about Bitcoin for a while. And quite honestly, I would get annoyed by people talking about Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, that's pretend money. But aside from the value of Bitcoin as an asset and an investment, which is really intriguing, what I've come to learn is Bitcoin with its blockchain technology, it basically, it mirrors what freedom actually is, mm -hmm. how it's built. So long story short, I got involved with Zion because it's the world's first social network that's literally built on blockchain, on the Bitcoin blockchain, which is the most sovereign, secure network we yeah. know. Yeah. Why? Because free speech matters. Mm -hmm. uh, connecting with people matter. So we can do that now in a decentralized way. And just because I know I have, like, I get to be in front of a lot of people, this is like Zion, what it does for humanity brings back freedom, sovereignty, and civility. I, just, I want to bring that to the world because we need solutions. It's one thing to look at yeah, Spotify, we do. YouTube, GoFundMe and be like, dude, it's fucked. But I don't know what to do about it. It's another thing to say it's fucked and here's what I'm going to do about it. There's a new paradigm. As the old paradigms, it's sinking ship. We can either stay on the ship and go down with it, wake up in communism. And my dog's barking. He doesn't like communism. He do not like it either. He doesn't. He's not a fan of Marxism. No. Um, or we can get off the ship and realize there's like a new way of doing things. Mm -hmm. So we can use our head for something other than a hat rack, that's, as that's our grandmothers it. used to say. Yeah. And using our heads in our lives as something other than us being in service to the centralized companies that use our data, sell our attention to advertisers. Right. And, and before I sound too pessimistic, dude, I am so grateful for all the big tech stuff they've brought to the world. Yeah. Like, like you and I, we wouldn't, you wouldn't know of me. I wouldn't know. We wouldn't yeah. be connected without big tech. Right. There's great blessings. And I, I think we're living it's in true. a time where it's time to take the best best of the blessings and leave the centralized control behind. Yeah, I think we are in that time where we're taking the best of the best and we're leaving the waste product behind in every possible way. We're leaving what doesn't serve us behind. And we're figuring out how to do that too. Yeah. So it, it sounds like Zion sounds like exactly that, that thing. But so you, you're going to work, what the purpose of it is, is to, they're not going to be able to 
erase you from yeah, yeah there's no they, overlord right there there's no overlord simply said because it's decentralized so right now you know we're we're broadcasting on youtube so my words i want to talk to you roseanne but right now my words go from me up to youtube all mm -hmm. their stuff and then they go to you and then youtube says cool now we'll send this to the hundred thousand people that are going to watch this mm -hmm. but what zion does is it allows us to be decentralized so we don't need to send to youtube for us them to filter or give us permission mm -hmm. we go directly to each other and last thing i'll say about that the the newer platforms that pledge not to censor like rumble mm -hmm. and getter dude i'm a fan i want mm -hmm. them to succeed i think they're a step away from the problem but they don't solve the problem because they're still centralized. They could have a changing of the guard, new CEO, they get acquired by somebody and mm -hmm. they're like, all right, we've told you we're not going to censor, but guess what? Mm -hmm. Our shareholders are putting some yeah, pressure exactly. on us. And you know, Roseanne, you, you know, speak your mind a little too freely. Yeah. You gotta go. Mm -hmm. But with Zion, we, it couldn't censor any user, even if it wanted to because it's built on the Bitcoin blockchain technology that literally makes it impossible to censor. And that's human nature. Like if you and I were sitting in your house and on the big Island, we're on the couch, we're having a chat, you know, Joe Biden's handlers in DC, it, it, even if they didn't like what we're talking about, they had no way to stop us because human nature is, we don't need permission to, right, to engage. speak. And, it, and if you stop liking what I'm saying, guess what? You stop listening or you walk away or you That's tell right. me, get out of my house, JP. Or we because, get in a big drunk fight in the yard. Yeah. Like or, so or, many people love to do in Hawaii. Then I'd love to do that with you. <laughs> After we look at your museum, let's get in a drunk fight in the yard. I want, to be, I want us to yell at each other. Yeah, I like yelling. <laughs> <laughs> Getting the so, ducks all scared. I love it. So I, I appreciate you asking about it, Roseanne. It, getting involved with Zion, I, I've done it because to me, the mission matters. I've, I, there is not a technical solution out there like it. I, I, again, I support the Rumbles and Getters, but I, I want the problem solved. Because but what about, what about all the horrible people that would use it to like go, okay, we're going to come for all the you know, people who wear red or green you know we're, let's all organize so we can come and murder all the people that like the color green you yeah. know i always worry about those people because they can use it too and get all organized and yeah. what do we do about that that was the first question i asked the founder it's like what okay. what if they start using it to facilitate terrorism and horrible mm -hmm. stuff like you're talking about killing people that like green i mean we need them yeah um so Zion is anti-censorship, but it's not about breaking the law. So if there was ever any evidence that, hey, there's like a terrorist using Zion to organize, we'd of course fully cooperate with the FBI and let law enforcement Unless do Unless you found can. out it was the FBI, then what would Dude, wouldn't we that do? be fun? <laughs> who, who would we report the FBI to? Is I that think like that's the quandary we're in right now, isn't it? I think I feel like um, I don't know. It, I, it, it feels like Joe Rogan's the answer. Like Joe, the FBI is corrupt. Could you please do something about this? Yeah. Can Joe save? Yeah. But <laughs> or maybe Chappelle. I don't know. Well, I think it will be comedy for sure. It's going to be comedy that saves everything. It has to be. Yeah. I, it, it's definitely. I mean, we're biased. We're comedians. So. Well, yeah course it's just comedy but i think it comedy it it's like we're in a big symphony right now like this symphony that's pro-humanity we want to help humanity we want freedom we want to get past this attempt at global control communism you know you have people like i saw you had a conversation with dr zelenko yes i love him i had a chance to talk with him a couple days ago and you have the the dr robert malone's then you have you know the joe rogan's then you have like every then you have comedians 
we need everybody. We're all yeah. playing the same song, just different instru instruments. So you've got like the comedians, the saxophones, you have the Dr. Malone's, the drum. and uh, That's every exactly right. We need it all. We need diversity of opinion. I I've been saying that for a long time. How can you talk about diversity without diversity of opinion? There's no diversity when there's only one sanctioned opinion. Did you see the Heather McDonald uh, or she... She's fractured her skull, so it's hard to laugh at that. But yeah, before I knew she had seriously hurt herself. Oh, I was laughing my ass off at that one. Yeah, um, she did her vex. Like I'm triple vaccinated, and this other vaccine, and I'm still good. Jesus. Then she goes, "Well, I think this is proof that Jesus loves me best." And which, I mean, you're not. I mean, I'm sort of religious, being a Jew and all. Well, at least I'm superstitious. At least I have the brains to be superstitious enough <laughs> not to tempt the Lord in all his glory. But she goes, I guess this proves that Jesus loves me best of all. Oh, crunk. Yeah. Uh, it kind of was so great. Like it was so great what that time when Oprah was given a speech about balance and she fell over. It's like God, the greatest comedian of all. Sometimes he engineers these falls, Pratt falls, they kind of yeah. are. That that That's going to wake up about a million people about the shots. And it's funny. It's horrible to say it. it, it I mean, it's atrocious and so <laughs> hilarious. Did you, did you hear... Um, has she given a response like trying to sweep it under the rug or justify it? I haven't I'm heard sure. any anything from her. I hope she's okay. Sir, yeah. But certainly. you know how many comics are just out there pandering to the CIA talking points? It makes me so sick. Yeah. You know, the pandering thing. I mean, I think God's going to get you for that. The comedy gods, they'll yeah. get you for that, don't you think? I, I, I do think so. And to me, the pandering, that's just an expression of woke culture. And whether someone loves them, hates them, or they're just programmed from the propaganda to hate them. 45th president of the United States, Donald Trump, said, everything woke turns to shit. <laughs> now, if there was anything that's born out of absolute truth, I think that statement is. And yeah. certainly woke comedy turns to shit. Woke <laughs> woke politics turns to shit. Like you mentioned diversity of ideas. Yeah. That's how we get smarter. That's how yeah. we become less dumb as individuals. Like give me a diversity of an idea so I can consider it and go from this level of thinking up to here if it's a good idea. But when we pretend diversity just has to do with what's between your crotch or what you've cut out of your crotch or what your skin yeah. color is. I think we're spitting in the face of Martin Luther King Jr. who yes, said, don't judge a person based on his skin color, judge them based on the content of their character. And I think the content of our character comes from our diversity of thoughts and perspectives. But now we're living in a warped time where we're being told the opposite. Don't have a diversity of ideas. Diversity comes from having someone who identifies as a cat, someone who's mm -hmm. black, someone who identifies as a, a, a man who's pregnant. And it's like, that's, that feels very shallow. I think Martin Luther King Jr. had it better than this woke culture narrative. Yeah, I, I like any reference to him uh, I, uh, because he was so far ahead of his time that it seems even radical, the things he said he would people would just not like him very much today would they <laughs> they wouldn't they like would, him very much it's like when uh, uh larry elder was running for governor of california when newsom earned himself a recall they, they start to say uh newsom's the black face of white supremacy and i oh you I, mean I, when they said larry elder was the black face of oh, white supremacy yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. How and, and dare then, they? How <laughs> effing dare they? And of course, it was a bunch of white people saying it. Well, it's, talk about white privilege. I go off on this all the time. White liberal privilege. That's where you get to speak for all black people. Yeah. You know, <laughs> what happened to letting black people speak for black people? Can well, we that can't be allowed because they don't like the way they 
they uh, <laughs> they don't like what they say. Um, also, what? Why are you running in here? You keep moving. Oh, I keep moving. It's fine. Oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you. They need to, Roseanne. They, Jake needs to staple you to the chair. Yeah, he he would probably like to do that. All my kids would like to staple me into one place. They're like, Mom. But I'm like, I'm a human being, for Christ's sake. Yeah, you know, I have five kids. You only have one. Are you going to have yeah. more kids? Uh, hopefully, yeah. Oh, we're, we're, cool. we're so satisfied and fulfilled with one. Yet, you know, after my wife has a little time kind of regaining the composure of having a baby and breastfeeding, then hopefully. To become human again? Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I like your, I like your, uh, your family things. I like your father um, videos. They crack me up when you're holding them. You go, why does he ever stop crying? Does he have autism? I thought that was the funniest thing. That was so hilarious of a perfect dad thing to say. He's cool. adorable, that kid. Wilder, he's adorable. Yeah, man. Mazel he... tov to you guys for that. Your little Thank family. You. Very happy. And as you can tell, he gets his, his adorable looks from mom. Yeah. He looks but, just yeah. like you, I hate to say. Well, yeah, I, I hate you to say that too. But <laughs> the, whatever the cute element of me is, it really shines in him. Well, um, I'd like to hear you give me some good news. So I, I always ask my, it's funny, The uh, sometimes the darkest of my comedic friends, they're also uh, the most hopeful people that I know. It's yeah. funny um an apt in a in a in a very cool spiritual way but so uh i think that i've wasted a lot of your time i have no idea what we're doing jake what am i on time 10 minutes. oh okay well that's the perfect 10 minutes that i'd like to ask you the i i want to make you responsible for my happiness and um so i would like you to Give me your take on how good things are getting, because you did say it at the beginning of this thing. You said, "I feel think I feel we're winning." You said, and I feel that you know the the uh, the uh, awakened people like us, the red pills, whatever we're gonna call us, uh, people who care about freedom and connection and other people and a better system that serves all people, not the few at the expense of the many, um, which is communism. Uh, I, I, I'd like you to give me your hopeful vision and view of now into the future, because I'm old and I have to have something to hold on to, so I'm making you responsible for my happiness. So go! <laughs> well, uh one, I would say on a, I'll give you two answers. One's on an individual basis and another's a little bit more collective. On an individual basis, I think here's our recipe for a beautiful future where our grandchildren and our great grandchildren are born and bathed into freedom, where they get to express themselves and have a beautiful life. I think here's what needs to happen on an individual basis. We all need to figure out what we as individuals stand for. Because I think if you don't stand for anything, you'll fall for anything. That's right. Because if you're a principled person and you've got your values, whatever they are, then when you have bullshit thrown at you, that's disguised as weaponized morality. Like, hey, good people will, uh, you know, separate their classes based on race. And like, of course you should, well, get your 12th shot. Like, well, look at that. But just because we said so for your protection. I mean, this has a death rate of 0.02%. I mean, you, but if we're a hmm. principled person who has values, Bullshit bounces off of that because it's like we're leaning on a solid oak tree. Those are our principles and our values. But if we don't stand for anything, we'll fall for anything. Bullshit will be a much more solid post than nothing. But if we're leaning against an oak tree uh, of us determining what we stand for as a person, then we're pretty solid mm. and we'll, we'll protect our birthrights. And then, you know, at more of a like everybody level what's happening in society that gives me hope like holy lord like you look at these 
brave, amazing truckers in yeah. Canada. Yeah. They last I checked, they've gotten four Canadian provinces to drop their mandates. They've got politicians now who were towing the line of Justin Trudeau, the tyrannical Trudeau. Mm -hmm. They're getting politicians to flip on him mm -hmm. in order to better serve the people. Man, and, and by the way, like Canada, like I'm ashamed as an American that Canadians are doing this and we're not. Now, Americans, we're doing some pretty awesome shit. I want to give us credit, but like, I'm so proud of these Canadians. They're amazing. So, but I look at what they're doing. I loved it playing in front of, I, I want to say, I loved Canadian audiences. Did you? They're so smart. I, I just they're, loved playing up there. They're very smart. They're also very white, aren't they? Yeah, well, you know, they're colder than hell. That's They don't get a lot of sun up there. <laughs> so I look at what's happening there. And then you look at the other evidence, like CNN's ratings have never been lower. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because people are waking up. And then I think right now, the good part is the evil that's been hiding in the world for decades, maybe centuries. 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 Oh, come on. Yeah. Since Babylon. It, yeah, I, I agree. It's not hidden anymore. No. We can see true. it. Mm -hmm. And a concealed weapon is more dangerous than a weapon we can see. That's when true. When you see evil... It's like, whoa, now we can do something about it. Mm -hmm. It's like Ram Dass. Yeah. He once said, you can't get out of a jail you don't know you're in. That's right. But if you can see the evil jail, now you can get out. Yeah. And, and the more Biden, Justin Trudeau, Fauci, Gates, Klaus Schwab, the more these yahoos talk, yeah. the better it is for us. Yeah, that's true. People up. Doesn't it look like they went through central casting to get these guys? I mean, like that Klaus Schwab, it looks like, uh, what's his name from the, uh, you know, this guy? The Dr. Evil? Yeah. It, it's central casting. And so it's, slouchy. Yeah. Like it's a, mass, so a little evil, mousy mass murderer. So it looks cliche. just like that. The, the one thing I like about Justin Trudeau, who makes me want to vomit in my mouth. Castro. Is he, they say Justin Castro. That's Justin weird. Castro. <laughs> he, he at least doesn't look like he went through central casting. He kind of like, oh, he's kind of handsome. He doesn't look blatantly evil. like Schwab. Until you see him dressed up in blackface with that Prince Sambo thing he's got on when he's yes. in blackface. Then it's like, oh, here's the real guy. A real rape, like when you see Prince Harry in that Nazi outfit, Yeah, you know, when he dressed up like a Nazi. Did you see that? I didn't see that one. Prince Harry at a, a, at a, a Halloween bash they threw. He was in full Nazi regalia, like how the royals were before they had to tone that down a little bit. How many people do you think like Prince Harry and Justin Trudeau had killed for not scrubbing those pictures off the face of the earth before they got leaked out? Well, probably, oh my God, if we're going to get really serious, I mean, probably whole countries full of people. I mean, probably India. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, my God, for centuries. Oh yeah. my God. Just think about what, those people, those royals. I mean, first of all, we would be living right now in this century and still having royal families. Are you kidding me? Talk about centralized power. Yeah. Talk about people taking their God-given beautiful sovereignty and power and handing it to someone else. Like, okay, you have power over me. Why? I don't know. That's just what we do. Yeah, we're waking up. I, th I think... You know, the World Economic Forum tells us, hey, we're doing the Great Reset. Fuck you guys. We're doing the Great Awakening. We're waking up from the old paradigm. It's crumbling. It's shedding. I think right now, you know. Like you they can canceled at... Davos. Did you know that? No. Uh, didn't, didn't they do that online, though? I'm not sure, but I think that once they got wind that we were laughing at them, I was going to bring it back to that. Once they saw that we weren't buying their bullshit and that we were actually laughing at them, they're crumbling at it. That's they're, what I see. Yeah. Well, they'd be morons not to cancel it. Like all the evil people getting together under the guise of we're going to solve 
climate change or whatever they pretend to do. Um, but you, you look at how everybody, like all the propagandists, they're now backpedaling on the narrative. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, the science is changing. No, midterm elections are coming. And you know your house of cards is crumbling and you're doing your best to salvage what you can. Because humanity is waking up. We're, as a species, we're inherently good. We're mm -hmm. inherently powerful. Yeah, and I, I think, think so we're too. in the process of a very spiritual and religious remembering of our great God-given power. Because we've forgotten for a long time. We're waking up, though. I, I love that. I, I love that as our, our final thought. Um, and I love talking to you. Uh, more power to you. I'll be watching. Boy, you're prolific as fuck. I am jealous, I have to say. God, do you write every day? I mean, you get up and you go right at it, I can tell, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh yeah, I write every day. That's my favorite part. Got the first three hours of my day blocked out just for writing. And man, you like, here's a, the script I wrote today. And Roseanne, you could come over to my house, take this script and burn it. I never filmed the video and it would still be a full therapeutic process for me. Mm -hmm. But being able to like write and then make a video and put it out to the world uh, several times a week, that's just like icing on the cake. I hope I can get my shit together and start doing that. That's why I'm doing this. I'm taking you for my inspiration and a few other comics too. I want to get back in the world. I want to move down there to Texas with y'all. Y'all are going to Texas. I, I, I think all of us would love to have you here, sister. And anything I can do to support you, your process or collaborating, doing things together, let me know. It would always be an absolute pl uh, pleasure. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it so much. I love you and I'll be watching for you. I hope that, uh, you know, we'll exchange often so that when you do come to Hawaii, when all this shit clears and I hope it clears this year, so we can get out there and, uh, you know, return to real life. Here's what I say. We got to we got to be funnier than we've ever dared to be. Right? Amen. That reminds me. I just that's such a mic drop and here I am ruining your mic yeah. drop. Fuck me. But uh, in in a, a green room I was in recently, you know how a lot of comedians will sign the walls. But Dave Chappelle, like I saw his name I'm like I want to see what he had to say. And I think he's such a great truth teller of God, our time. God is great. And his message was, dear comedians, you have one job and one job only. Keep telling the truth. And right now, there's nothing more dangerous than telling the truth. And that's why it takes courage to be true to the truth principle now. But man, amen to what you said, sister. Amen to you and your lovely family and your wonderful life. And uh, we'll keep on. We'll Love keep it. on. Thank Love you. you. Bye. Thank you. That was awesome. What do I do now? No, I'm what doing it. I'm stopping. Say bye, everyone. Off. What do I do, huh? Just say bye. I'll hit the button. Push Thank what? you, JP. I got Thank it. Thank you.